Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this special webinar session. And this morning, we're going to be talking about investing in a time of crisis. So we're going to explore the current situation, what we're seeing going on in markets. And it's amazing to think how much has changed even since this presentation was conceived and that that was only a few weeks ago to the point where, in fact, I've had to go through this morning and update many of the slides that I only prepared last week you know and some of them were looking really quite out of date in the space of about seven or eight days so that just shows you really how quickly things are moving at the moment and, and what we're dealing with so before we jump into that just by way of a brief introduction uh, my name is Matthew Smith Managing Director of Buckingham Gate Chartered Financial Planners and as the name suggests we are an independent firm of Chartered Financial Planners uh, we're based in central London and our offices are on Northumberland Avenue although we now have clients really across all four corners of the UK, given the, uh, the, the technology that we now have available to us. Uh, please don't be fooled by the name. Our offices can now be found on Northumberland Avenue. So although we started life on Buckingham Gate, which is where we take our name, uh, we're now on Northumberland Avenue, just off Trafalgar Square. Uh, we're probably one of about 500 chartered financial planning firms now operating in the UK. All of our advisory staff are fellows of the Personal Finance Society, which is their highest possible accolade. And I'm delighted to say we were recently voted one of the top 25 financial planning firms in the UK as well. And we really have three core areas of expertise. One of those, of course, we'll focus on in detail today in the form of investment management. Uh, we do a huge amount of estate planning and inheritance tax mitigation work for clients. Uh, and also we assist clients with their retirement planning as well. Now, it's not just me here. I'm supported by a wonderful team. Uh, these are some of the most qualified and experienced financial planning professionals in the UK. And if you would like to work with us in the future, hopefully you will uh, be lucky enough to meet some of these friendly faces as well. So we are recording the session this morning. And indeed, there, there are other webinar sessions that we have available which are recorded as well. So towards the end of the webinar. I suspect this morning's session probably will run for about 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, towards the end, I'll give you some instructions on how to complete a feedback form. And when you complete that feedback form, that will then release the webinar recordings to you. Uh, you will be taken to a page that has some of our older webinar sessions recorded for you. And then the recording for this session will probably arrive with you at some point early next week. So before we dive in, just the usual uh, regulatory points. Of course, we have the, the usual caveat that always applies to investing. The past is no reliable guide to the future. Uh, of course, the value of investments can go up or down, as can the income that they generate. And just to make clear, this presentation is not designed to constitute individual advice, and we should not take or refrain from any action purely based on this presentation. Uh, of course, if you would like specific advice, for your own circumstances, we would be delighted to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you. So I think it's fair to say that we, we really are living in unprecedented times. And th th this is a word that must have been used perhaps a hundred times more than usual over the last maybe three or four years. It just feels like everything is unprecedented at the moment. And of course, the things we're dealing with now are unprecedented in the same way that many of the events we've dealt with over the last few years. So of course, right at this moment, we've got inflation running at levels not seen since the 1970s. We've got the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, I think in the early days, there was perhaps some hope that things might be resolved quickly. However, it looks like that really is going to be a, a long running issue that we're dealing with. Uh, we have continued COVID lockdowns in China and in other parts of Asia, they're still living under very severe economic and movement restrictions, which of course is having an impact on economies. Uh, we have parts of the world that have gone through droughts and have had very little rainfall this year, other parts with some of the worst floods on record. We've got the energy supply and demand issue, which of course we're all very familiar with now, probably based on our energy bills. And uh, just in the last week or so, of course, we've had a new government and the, the now famous uh, budget that is not a budget, that has caused all of this turmoil in markets just over the last few weeks. And we will be talking about that in more detail in just a moment. Uh, and that's just what we're dealing with right now. If you think about just the last couple of decades, nobody can forget the financial crisis, of course, in 2008. And you know, from that point, we had 
just under a decade of, of what you might call relative stability. But we then had the Brexit vote in 2016. Of course, we had COVID in 2020, 2021. We've now had the Russia-Ukraine situation in, in 22. And now we have this bond issue driven by the government's budget. So I think entirely reasonable to say markets have been through the mill a bit. You know, markets have been through a lot. And it, it does feel a little bit like one thing after another at the moment. And I think some investors are feeling perhaps just a little bit downtrodden on the back of that. And we're thinking, oh, you know, not another thing. Surely we're going to enter a period of, of growth and normality soon. However, despite all of this, you know, despite what we're dealing with right now and what we've dealt with over these last couple of decades, if we zoom out a bit and take a, a longer term view, this is a 15 year view. So that this takes us back just before the financial crisis. We see here that during that 15 years, the FTSE 100 in the blue here has delivered a, a relatively respectable 105% return. I think if you offered me that in the next 15 years, I'd be fairly happy. Um, the S&P, however, in America has delivered nearly a 500% return over that same period. So yes, all of this has been going on, but still markets have delivered very, very high and consistent returns for patient investors that are willing to sit through these periods of volatility. And what really stands out for me, you know, and this is always the case when you zoom out and take a slightly longer term view, what really stands out for me when you look at these charts is if you go back to the left hand side and just look at that 07 to 09 period, and of course, during that we had the 2008 crisis, it's amazing just how little that seems to now register on the Richter scale when you put it in this 15 year context in terms of how markets have performed. We see the COVID crash was far more severe. Of course, the recovery was far faster as well. Uh, and yeah, we've had a, a bit of volatility in recent weeks, given what's going on in the world with inflation, interest rates and energy prices at the moment. So despite everything, markets have continued to deliver uh, and actually events that felt incredibly significant at the time now register really just as a little blip on the graph rather than looking perhaps quite so significant. However, we are, I think, entering a new chapter in the financial history books. And I'll talk a bit about this a little bit later as well. We had that period pre-2007, before the financial crisis, and, and that was probably a period of a few decades where you, you might say you had relative economic normality. You know, things were probably roughly neutral in many ways. You know, interest rates were running at sort of relative averages. The markets were behaving largely as we expect. And the financial crisis really rewrote the rule books when it comes to how we manage economies and, and how markets behave. And so from that point, from 2007 through to the end of last year, through to the end of 2021, to me, that represents a very clear and very distinct period in economic history where nothing was working as it should. Uh, and we were really in uncharted waters. We've never had a period really of any significance, let alone 15 odd years, with 0% interest rates around the world or quantitative easing, this money printing program. So we've lived for 15 years nearly under largely artificial circumstances and now very very quickly indeed really in the space of the last six months we're now I think flipping the page and starting a new chapter in the history books and of course things are now changing very very rapidly some might say they are returning to normal but perhaps much faster than we anticipated so zooming in a little bit I'm just going to focus on this year and probably the standout issue, and of course, this is making headline news at the moment this year, is how the bond market has reacted to what's going on in the world. So we see here that the, the stock markets, this is the FTSE and the S&P, so FTSE 100, top 100 companies in the UK, uh, S&P, top 500 companies in America. We see that, I'll make this very clear, for a sterling investor, for a UK-based sterling investor, both the FTSE 100 and the S&P are down two or three percent year to date, which is never pleasant. You know, none of us like to see a loss on our portfolio, but actually that's, you know, that's par for the course. We expect those kinds of movements. Now, it's important to mention that the reason the S&P looks so healthy here 
is because we're showing this in sterling terms. This is for a UK based pound sterling investor. The S&P in dollar terms has actually fallen getting on for 25 percent this year. So the US market has really not had a great time. It's been depending on your perspective, it's either been the strength of the dollar or the weakness of the pound that has improved returns or, or at least minimized losses for a UK based investor. And again, we'll come on to currencies a little bit later. The standout issue this year, though, is how the gilt market has performed. And, and I've used UK gilts, UK government bonds here as a good example. But you can say the same about government bond markets in most parts of the Western world and indeed many corporate bonds as well. And we see here that the UK gilt index, this is just an aggregate of all of the, the UK government bonds in issue, has fallen over 30 percent year to date. And again, it's that same word, but that really is unprecedented. We really are living in very unusual times and things have changed very, very rapidly. Just look at the right hand side of the chart here and you'll notice that up until the end of August, so going into September, the gilt market was down maybe 10 or 15 percent, which is still a very substantial drop, but probably loosely within the, the kind of expected parameters. But just in this last month or so, we've seen a real precipitous decline to a, a more than 30% fall. And that's all the more ironic when you think that a government bond, a UK gilt, is often described by investment professionals as a risk-free asset. In this case, they've fallen something like 30%. Uh, and that's what has led the Bank of England just in the last 48 hours to take very severe action, you know, intervene very significantly in markets, because so many pension funds are effectively underwritten by government bonds. They, they use those because they are supposedly consistent and stable assets that they can use to underwrite their liabilities. When you have something like a 30% drop and, and a 15% fall just in a matter of a week or two, that really was getting to the point where a lot of UK pension funds were in significant trouble and may have gone pop effectively. So that's the reason we've seen the Bank of England step in just in the last couple of days. So that's one sort of area where we've seen significant divergence between the different asset classes. And this is now, you might say, unusual, because for the last 15 years or so since the financial crisis, bonds and equities have actually moved pretty well in lockstep with each other, which is the opposite to what we would normally expect. You know, bonds and equities generally are combined in a portfolio because they're what we call negatively correlated, where, where one goes up, the other goes down typically, and, and vice versa. And, and I think we're perhaps starting to see that more traditional relationship restored once again, but we're doing so in a very painful and a very quick way. Now, that's not the only dynamic which is shifting at the moment. We see a very significant divergence. This is just the UK market, but you see similar things going on in other economies as well. We see a very significant divergence between large and small cap businesses. So generally speaking, especially in the UK, the large cap that the real behemoth businesses that sit in the FTSE 100. So this is the likes of Shell, BP, HSBC, Tesco's, etc. They've actually weathered the storm really rather well. In fact, the FTSE 100 is showing a positive gain year to date, only, only a, a fraction of a percent or two, but still better than nothing. Uh, the smaller cap shares, though, smaller businesses, both in the FTSE 250, you know, and these are still big high street names, but they tend to be more domestically focused. And certainly on the small cap index, they've had a much worse time. They're showing losses of something between about 14 and 18 percent year to date. So there's a big divergence here between the big businesses and the small businesses. And so when we look at how a stock market is performing in aggregate. The large businesses, of course, are larger, so they have a bigger influence on the overall index. So you might think, oh, UK shares are doing OK this year in relative terms, if you're looking at a kind of total UK index compared maybe to the US or Europe. Uh, and that is true. But the outperformance is driven by a very, very small part of the market, even within the FTSE 100. The only sectors really that are showing significant growth are pe you know, people like the energy companies, the Shells, the BPs, Centrica. Those kinds of businesses are really propping up the rest of the index, which hasn't done so well. So another interesting dynamic to be aware of. 
And this is another thing that has changed massively this year as well. The relationship between growth and value shares. Now, to be honest, I, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of those particular titles. I, I think they are perhaps somewhat arbitrary, but the investment world seems to like them and they, they create indices and, and other metrics so that we can measure. Uh, and traditionally, you know, the value shares are your more conservative, steady eddy businesses. They will often feature uh, companies like the utilities businesses, the energy companies, banks, insurers, supermarkets, they will tend to fall in your value category. And then growth tends to be the, the slightly more aggressive businesses, perhaps in technology, uh, biotech, pharmaceuticals, that they're, they're often put in that growth category. And for the 15 years, again, I, I keep talking about this, this, this new chapter we've started. In the 15 years that followed the financial crisis, it was all about growth. You know, growth shares outperformed astronomically compared to value shares pretty well for the whole of that 15 year period. But even that was largely driven just by a very small part of the market, by the US technology sector primarily. But if you're using these two categories, then growth by a huge margin outperformed value. But that dynamic has shifted this year. And again, this is the year to date figures. We see the value index has delivered a three and a half percent return versus a 12 percent loss for the growth index. And again, this is in sterling terms. So if you were investing in US dollars, your loss on the growth index would be much, much more significant. So again, it's just a sign of shifting sands. Things are changing. We are entering, as I say, in my view, a new chapter in the economic history books. And there's a real risk here that we kind of, we miss the boat and we miss what really is a, a big sign that perhaps how we built portfolios needs to change. You know, how we manage our investments might need to change in light of what are changing circumstances. And this brings me on to highlight some of the, the investing mistakes that we so often see do-it-yourself do investors making. These are so common and most people are impacted by these mistakes in some way, shape or form. Now, the, the first mistake a lot of people make is trying to, uh, I, I stress the word trying to, trying to time the market, thinking that we know best, we know what's going to happen next week, next month, next year, uh, and therefore, you know, timing our investments accordingly. It always makes me, uh, it makes me smile slightly when a client says to me, oh, well, you know, I, I I, I don't want to invest right now because oh, don't you know there's a recession coming? And it's sort of like, well, yes, th there might be a recession coming. But of course, if you know that, you know, as a private individual investor sitting in your study, if you know that, then of course the market knows that. You know, the market is just a collection of its participants, including all of the investment banks, not just in the UK, but around the world, all of the other private individual investors, pension funds, hedge funds, you know, it's all of those people that make up the market. So if you've had a thought process, chances are the market has had the thought process as well. And therefore the market has priced in everything that we currently know today. All known information that's available today is priced in to the market. So it's only new and therefore unknown information that will drive market prices significantly one way or the other. Now, up until lunchtime yesterday, we had no idea the government, you know, bond programme was going to be started by the Bank of England. But as soon as they made that announcement, all markets start moving in the right direction. But of course, until that announcement, none of us had a clue that that was what was going to happen. So it's unknown information that's moving markets. And the problem is, I always think if you're trying to time the market, by definition, you're probably going to be late. Because, of course, if you're timing the market, one assumes you're looking at the chart and we're, we're watching it going down and we're, we're thinking, OK, when do I enter? When do I invest my money? Now, if the, mar you know, if the market's going down, in order for us to identify that things have changed, it has to start going up, one would assume. We, we have to see a change in that trend line. Now, let's say, well, let's use yesterday as a really great example. The market went up a bit. Now, is that the sign of a, a, a shift? You know, is, is, have we reached the all time low and it's going to go up now? Or is that just one day and might it continue going down? So we're probably going to wait a bit more to establish if we've actually got a trend here or whether this is just a, a single day. And the challenge is, have, having done that, you miss out on a huge amount of returns. 
So if you are five days late investing off of a market bottom, you will normally lose about 12% in total returns over the following 12 months. And that's only five days. So the market's been falling, it's reached its bottom, and then we, we think a trend has established, the, the direction has changed, and only five days later you've got to make the judgment to think, yep, this is the bottom, the bottom's been reached, we're now back on the upward trajectory. But if you've missed those five days, you lose 12% on average in your returns. If you're only 15 days late, which I would suggest most people would be, you lose 22% in returns over the following 12 months on average. And as I say, by definition, if we're watching the charts and trying to time things, we're almost by definition going to be late to the party. Because by the time we've noticed that something has changed, it's already changed by definition. I think very often people fail to react to what's going on. And yeah, as I say, we have a really big shift, I think, in, in the way that the economy is going to work moving forward. Some might argue the shift is actually just back to relative normality. And, and perhaps that's true. But I think it's fair to say that the next 15 years probably will look quite different to the last 15 years. And we have to pause at this point and think, you know, what do we need to do within our portfolios? We all know the adage, this is a similar point, really, you know, the past is no guide to the future. And, and I think, you know, that is so true, especially when we're going through this kind of economic inflection point that we are right now. We often see people investing with no strategy, you know, that there's no overall strategy in terms of how they're putting a portfolio together, that they're just buying, you know, random best buy funds that they're sort of picking up ad hoc because, they were featured in a newspaper or something. And, and that's not necessarily to say that any of those investments is bad or good in, in of itself. But how is everything fitting together? How does this portfolio work as a whole rather than just buying individual little bits and pieces? This is a really interesting one. You know, we, we, we're all probably familiar with the phrase in the investing world, don't try to catch the falling knife. And, and that's, you know, referring to this sentiment that when something has fallen, maybe it presents a really good buying opportunity and therefore it might be a good time to enter the market. Now, if we're dealing with individual companies or individual shares, it, it's a 50-50 really. You know, it, it, is this company a falling knife or is it just falling, as I've said here? You know, investments fall consistently over different periods of time and that can present a really good buying opportunity, a chance to acquire these assets at a significant discount. But is it just a temporary decline? Or actually, has this company had its day? You know, does the economic environment mean it's going to be less successful? Has the way that we purchase products shifted to mean that this company is going to struggle more now than, than in the past? So I think it's always worth just sense checking, you know, just because something has fallen 50%, it may well represent a really good time to buy, or that could just be the start of a story that continues and maybe the, the stock falls by 90% or something in the future. And I think, especially for self-investors, this is a really important point. Think about the time scales over which you have held your investments. And the reason I say this is because the majority of consumer platforms now that we use online when you log in and you look at your list of investments, they tend to show you the total gain or loss that a holding has made during the total time period that you have held that particular share or fund. And the challenge with that is you've probably held different shares and funds for different time periods. So looking down your list, you know, you might have one holding that's grown by 15 percent, another that's grown by 110, another one that's lost 10 percent, another one that's gained 24 and if you purchased all of those on the same day, then, of course, that's a fair comparison. And you, you can see how they're doing. But normally we haven't. You know, we've acquired different assets at different times. So looking at that list of, of relative gains or losses doesn't really give us a fair comparison in terms of how they've performed on average or in recent years. And I think this is a real risk because let's say you purchased a fund 15 years ago. And then for the next three years, it grew by 100% a year. So you, at that point, you're showing a 300% gain. During the next 12 years, it only grows by 1% a year. So at the end of my 15 years, I'm now showing a 312% gain. Now, I think all of us would be pretty happy with that if we could get that in the following 15-year period. 
But in that example, clearly it's a very silly and extreme example, but all of the return happened 12 years ago, basically. And since then, the fund's actually been a bit of a laggard. It's not been performing awfully well. But when we log in, it probably still appears as one of our top performers because it's showing such a big gain overall. So just be aware of that when you're reviewing portfolios. Think, how long have I held this fund? When did I buy it? What's my average annual return? And when was that return generated? Has the fund performed consistently? Or actually, did it do really well 10 years ago? And since then, it's actually been lagging behind some alternative options. And what I've been trying to communicate really in the, the last 25 minutes or so is that what got you here may not get you there. I think the, the world has changed quite substantially. We have flipped a page and we need to just change our thinking as a response. So I'm going to go through some, some portfolio planning ideas some things that you might want to think about in terms of your own investment portfolio. So as everything is going on, I think it's a great idea to kind of go back to basics and just review our finances, review our investments, review our savings, review our borrowings. We'll, we'll talk about all of those things. But before we do any of that, I think the first thing we should be doing is reviewing the plan, the overall financial plan. Because it's quick and easy to forget that money is just a tool. You know, we, we talk about it a lot. Of course, it's in the media constantly at the moment. But money really should serve us. You know, money is a tool for us to do the things we want to do in our life. But a lot of people don't really know how much money they need or how much return they should be targeting. So the first thing we do when we work with clients is put together a lifetime financial plan for them. So we take all of their incomes, their expenditures, their assets, their liabilities, and then project all of that until they're maybe 90 or 100 years old. And we, we, we finish up with one of these, a lifetime cash flow forecast. And that really has the ability to answer some of the big questions that we have about our finances. How much is enough? How much money do I need? How much could I spend on holidays each year? Could I afford to give some money to the children to help them with a property deposit? You know, those are the things that we have money for. That's what we want to use the money for, one assumes. It, it doesn't really serve any purpose in of itself. So I think the investment decisions that we make should be informed by our financial plan. Because once we've got the answer to those big questions, that can then inform the correct investment strategy to help you achieve those objectives. So before we begin with any investment planning, we always do a plan for our clients. You know, what is the plan? And therefore, what portfolio do we need to bring the plan to life? So in terms of our specific savings investment portfolios, the first thing I want to talk about is cash. And, you know, it, it, it's perhaps a bit unusual for an investment advisor to be talking about cash. And indeed, this has been a bit of a wasted conversation for the last 15 years or so. Now, we know that since the financial crisis, you know, interest rates on cash have been effectively zero or something pretty close to that. And therefore, most people really haven't paid cash a great deal of attention. And frankly, that was probably the right thing to do. We haven't been going through this process of shopping around for the best savings rates or, or structuring our cash holdings, because quite frankly, everything was paying something close to zero. <laughs> You know, the, the time and effort you have to go through to earn a, an extra 0.05% just felt like it was barely worth it. Whereas now the environment, of course, is changing very quickly. And so I think it's really worth investing some time in reviewing your cash position. So point number one, how much cash do you actually need? And point number two, when do you need it? You know, th those are really good questions to ask yourself. A lot of, lot of people have a notional pot of cash that they just want to hold and doesn't necessarily have any foundation. It's just a number that we've got used to. You know, oh, I, I always keep 200,000 in cash. Now, maybe you need 200,000 in cash, but maybe you don't. So I think it's just worth asking that question. You know, wh what, what do I need the cash for? When am I going to use it? If it's just an emergency fund, well, what emergencies am I preparing for? And how much might those emergencies cost if they did indeed come to fruition? So it's really worth having that conversation with yourself. You know, how much cash do we need and when is it required? And then that can inform what kind of savings structure we put in place. Now, all of us probably are going to want some level of cash on easy access, and, and that's totally understandable. But there's a, a huge now 
divergence and, and real competition in the savings market once again. So the bank that you're currently with for your day-to-day -day savings may not be paying a particularly attractive rate of interest. That was certainly true in my case. And so I've now started this process of moving money around. You know, is, are, are there better rates elsewhere? This is an exercise that people did on a, a six monthly basis before 2007, but it just hasn't really been worthwhile for these last 15 years, but that's changing now really very quickly. And the other question to ask yourself is, should you be fixing into bonds, if you like, with your cash right now? You know, there are one year, two year, three year bonds available. Should you be fixing into those rates, which of course are, are higher than instant access? To put it into perspective, that at the moment, as I speak today, this, this might have changed in the next half an hour, who knows? But at the moment, as I talk, the best instant access savings accounts are paying about 2.2%. You can get 4.2% on a one-year bond and actually similar rates on a three, four, five-year bond. They're all paying around 4%. Now, given that we expect rates to increase further, I'd be reluctant to fix for a hugely long period. But right now, you know, maybe a six or a 12-month fix, given that they're paying roughly double an instant access account, that, that may be sensible. But watch this space because it, we're expecting potentially a very significant base rate increase in the November Bank of England meeting if they don't bring it forward ahead of that to, to calm markets down. However, however, having said all of that, and of course it's a good thing that cash is paying a better return, I now think that cash is a more dangerous asset than it has been for the last 15 years as well. Because of the delta, the difference between cash and inflation. So during that 15 year period, post financial crisis, yes, interest rates were pretty close to zero, you might have got 1% if you were lucky. But inflation was also running at very low levels as well. You know, inflation for that whole period has been pretty well at or below target for the majority of that, that time period. So the difference maybe was, you know, you were losing maybe one or 2% of purchasing power each year. Now, however, that delta has increased quite substantially. So we now have inflation running north of 10%. And yes, you can get 4% on your savings, but that's still a 6% loss of purchasing power year on year. So as I say, although rates are better, I think all of us want to hold some level of cash. And it's worth maximizing that, of course. We want to get the best return that we can. But I still think cash is a, a very dangerous asset class from an inflation perspective. Uh, and don't let the interest rates lull you into a false sense of security. Now, speaking of interest rates, this isn't necessarily investment related, but it sort of is. Think about reviewing any borrowings that you might have as well. So once again, I think we had different eras. Pre-2007, as advisors, generally speaking, if clients had excess money or cash floating around, but they also had borrowings, you know, mortgages, credit cards, loans, generally speaking, the advice would be to pay off the borrowings first. Because back then, of course, you know, the interest rates on your mortgage were probably five or six percent. And if you pay the borrowing off, you, you effectively get a guaranteed tax free return of five or six percent, which is, is pretty reasonable. But that advice changed again in this kind of 07 to 21 era, because your mortgage was then at maybe one or two percent. And there was a reasonable degree of confidence of earning six, seven, eight percent on an investment portfolio. In many cases, people chose, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to keep my debt outstanding. And if I've got excess money, I'll invest that elsewhere with a hope of generating higher returns. But I think now we have very much and very quickly gone back to the long term norm. And from right now onwards, once again, I think it's going to be sensible to start thinking about repaying any expensive borrowings if we've got excess money or excess cash available. And I don't think we've finished with this story yet. If we look at what markets are projecting, the, 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 the assumption now is that the Bank of England base rate is going to be something around 5% by the middle of next year. And that would imply a fixed rate mortgage offer might be available probably in that sort of 6 to 7% range. So clearly mortgage rates and other borrowing rates have increased significantly in the last few months. But I don't think the story is finished quite yet. And that may have further to run. Now, if we arrive at this place, you know, if, if we're paying, let's say, 6% on a, 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 an average mortgage, 
at that point, I think it potentially makes quite a lot of sense to repay borrowings, even if we've got excess cash available, because you get a guaranteed 6% return, no strings attached, and it's a tax-free return effectively as well. So if you were investing elsewhere, perhaps in a taxable investment, you probably need to be generating maybe 8% net of fees in order to kind of match the return that you might receive. So again, it's just a shift in thinking from this last 15 years. We, we need to just readjust our mindsets and how we think about the difference between cash investments and borrowing. However, for a brief period, there may be this opportunity to, to do what the market would call a bit of arbitrage and just sort of make a benefit out of the current situation. So having said, it might make sense to repay borrowings and doing so gives you a guaranteed tax-free return. And clearly we need to now think about that as part of our financial planning. Many borrowings will still be in a fixed rate of some description. So if you're currently sitting there, you know, one year into a five year fixed rate mortgage, of course you're sitting pretty for the next four years. Now, again, perhaps like myself, you might be very aggressively thinking about how do I pay the mortgage off at the end of that period? Because of course we, we assume it's going to be much more expensive when the end of that fixed rate, you know, uh, and we need to renegotiate something new. But if you're in that situation where the borrowings are still fixed at a low level, could you invest the cash now elsewhere to generate a higher return during that period of time? As I've just said, we can get a 1%, uh, sorry, a one year bond paying 4%, north of 4% at the moment. So perhaps if I've got some money in savings, I'm planning to use that money to clear the mortgage in four years time. I can generate 4% on the savings and that number may well go up, I suspect in the next few months. And I'm still only paying 1% on the mortgage for the time being. So just in that interim period, there's potentially an opportunity to play around a little bit and, and just make a little bit of extra money in the, the, the interim period. And this isn't only true of mortgages. I, I think we'll see interest rates increasing across the board. I think car finance deals, you know, they've been widely available either on an interest free basis or many deals were maybe at two or three percent. Credit cards, you know, at the moment, there are still some decent interest free, you know, balance transfer or money transfer deals. I suspect they might be harder to come by or if they are, they'll, they'll be with larger fees. The rates on credit cards and overdrafts probably will start to increase as well. So, you know, think about your borrowing, not just, in, you know, in a mortgage holding, but also across the board. There might be some other borrowings that are worth clearing as well. Now, the other thing we've mentioned already is that the, you know, the, the bond market has changed dramatically in a very short period of time. So since, again, 2008, there's a theme developing here, isn't there? Since 2008, you know, bond yields have been very, very low. You know, the, the average UK government bond has been paying probably around 1%, in many cases less than that. Uh, and in a few cases, government bonds have been paying zero or in some cases even negative yielding. So, you know, for a, for a decent chunk of time over these last 15 years, German bunds, for example, have been negative yielding. So you give the German government your money and then you pay them some more money for the privilege of holding it as well. Which, of course, just it seems insane. It seems totally balmy. But that, you know, that has been the value of the perceived security of those German bunds. Now, however, again, things have changed very rapidly. This is one of the slides that I had to rewrite because I put this deck together last week and the world has changed significantly in the last seven days or so. So yields are rising very quickly. Uh, now, what was something like a 0% yield on a 10-year government bond, uh, now it's around 4% we can get on a 10-year government bond. However, we have what's known as a very flat yield curve at the moment. And what this means is there's not a huge difference in the rate of return that you get, depending on which, which length of bond that you buy. So as of about half an hour ago, as I, I updated these numbers, a two year government bond is paying 4.2%, a five year bond 4.3%, a 10 year bond 4.01%, and a 30 year bond 3.9%. So you actually get slightly less as an average return investing for a longer period. And that suggests that markets believe that interest rates will cool down a bit in the sort of medium to long term, but they expect them to rise in the, the, the shorter term. But it really does just show you how quickly things have changed and how dramatic this shift has been. 
And so I think it's time to begin the thought process of bonds perhaps once again becoming a part of our investment portfolios. As I say, a note of caution here, things are still likely to change. So we, we may not quite be at the point where, yes, let's press the button, but we probably want to start this thought process. Because I think bonds now will probably start to retake their traditional role in portfolios, which is to pay a meaningful yield, a regular consistent income. I've just mentioned a 10-year government bond now will pay you over 4%. Uh, in the corporate bond market, even some very good quality corporate bonds will pay 6%, 7 8% in the current market. There's more potential for bonds to offer a diversification benefit. You know, the reason we use bonds in portfolios is to counterbalance the equity component. And under normal circumstances, as I say, you'd expect them to be negatively correlated. If one goes up, the other comes down and vice versa. That hasn't necessarily been true during that 15 year period following the financial crisis. There is some caution required here, though. Of course, not all bonds are created equal. You need to be very careful with what you're buying. And I think it's reasonable to assume that, you know, some companies, dare I say it, some governments uh, may fail in the next few years. So, you know, do due diligence, do be careful and think about what bonds we're buying and again, how they sit within the overall portfolio. And then on the equity side, again, there's been a huge shift. There's been a shift in terms of the growth versus value dynamic. There's been a shift between large and small caps, and there's been a big divergence between different markets. As I've said, the UK is actually one of the better performing markets this year, and some of the others have fallen quite substantially. So think about current positioning. Do things need to change in light of what could be a, a very different investing world? Think about the value versus the growth allocations that you have and the geographical allocations. And now might be a really good time to rebalance things back to your ideal asset allocation. So really, as an investor, we should have an asset allocation model. So this is our kind of starting point. I want to allocate 20% to US equities, 10% to UK equities, 10% to UK property, and so on and so forth. Now, what we tend to find is that many DIY investors, they don't go through that process of asset allocation. They tend to build portfolios from the bottom up. So that they, they'd start by picking individual shares or funds and end up just kind of chucking them into a pot. But that doesn't necessarily mean there's an overall asset allocation strategy that sits above it. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later on. And just a couple of other financial planning ideas for you to think about. This sounds like I'm stating the bleeding obvious, which, of course, I am to a certain extent. But, you know, just reconsider. Am I maximizing the return on all of my different assets? Cash is the real easy example, as I've just mentioned. Think about your cash positioning. I also think buy-to-let properties need possibly reconsidering as well. That's not to say that they're a bad idea or a good idea. Of course, every property is a, a unique proposition. But you might have a whole portfolio which is currently mortgaged at 2%, and in three years' time, you might have to mortgage it at 6% interest. That's obviously going to change the net return profile of that portfolio. And again, you have to ask yourself, maybe there's better opportunities elsewhere. Retirement planning is also going to change, I think, in light of what's going on. And annuities potentially, I stress the word potentially, but annuities potentially now have a role to play in retirement planning once again. Now, before 2007, again, that same theme, annuities were quite popular because they were paying a reasonably decent return and they provide total security and consistency of income. Uh, and it's really interesting because, of course, if you go around on the street and ask people, would you like a guaranteed income for the rest of your life? Of course, they say, oh, yes, that sounds wonderful. Yes, please. And then if you ask them, would you like an annuity? They say, oh, no, I don't want one of those. Definitely not. Now, of course, it's, it's one and the same thing. But annuities have just got a bad press in recent years because the returns were so low. You know, annuity returns are intrinsically linked to interest rates. So annuities have not really been a particularly compelling proposition for that 15 year roughly period. But once again, it's just a question, you know, does an annuity now have a role to play in your retirement planning? If that annuity might yield six or seven percent rather than one or two percent, maybe it's a, a much more attractive proposition 
And it doesn't have to be the whole story. You know, nowadays, because we have flexibility, we can just do partial annuity purchase. So that's something which many people may wish to start thinking about. And, and as usual, but this is a message which I think applies perhaps even more so in these difficult economic times, think about tax planning as well. Because, of course, you know, every pound less tax that we pay gives us a pound more in our returns. And, and the same is true with the costs of our investment portfolios. Of course, if we can reduce our investing costs, we increase our net returns as well. And on this tax point, again, I, I keep banging on about it, but again, think about your cash position, because it could well be that you've got money in joint names or money, you know, if you're in a couple in the wrong person's name, the higher rate taxpayer perhaps has got a lot of cash in their name. And again, the last 15 years, that hasn't really come with much consequence. Whereas moving forward, if we're thinking we might be earning four, five, six percent on cash once again, just makes sense to think about the tax planning there. How can we distribute the cash to give us the lowest possible tax liability? And it's worth just reminding yourself of all of the different allowances that we have available. So as an individual, of course, we've got our, our traditional tax-free personal allowance. We've potentially got up to £2,000 of tax-free dividends, £1,000 of tax-free savings, £12,300 worth of capital gains exemptions as well. So as an individual, if you structure things correctly, you can actually generate nearly £28,000 worth of tax-free income or growth each year. And if you're in a couple or a civil partnership, of course, it's double. So nearly £56,000 worth of tax-free income and growth. And that's before we add on any income or return from ISAs or investment bonds or tax-free cash out of pensions as well. So there's a real opportunity here just to optimise and think about tax planning. And especially with the announcements made in this budget that wasn't a budget, whether you like them or loathe them, I think it presents probably the most generous tax planning environment I can remember in well over 15 years now in the financial services world. So my advice to clients currently is make hay while the sun shines. Um, we may, of course, have U-turns on these policies in the next few days. <laughs> But if we don't, I suspect we may do in the next few years. So I, I think what we have now from a personal tax planning perspective is a bit of a golden era. Whether you agree with the policies or not, that, that's a whole nother debate. But thinking about your own tax planning, it does really represent a really interesting opportunity. So just before I, I go through some, some questions, I can see some people actually have been asking some questions already. I'm just going to talk you briefly through how we go about managing portfolios on behalf of our clients. And all of this begins with asset allocation, because all of the research now shows that asset allocation really makes up the vast majority of our overall portfolio returns. But yet we don't seem to give it a great deal of attention in the investment world. So there's a massive disconnect here between what actually matters and what people think matters and what people therefore talk about. So if you look at all of the financial pages, you look at all the columns, the personal money sections, we spend hours and days and huge volumes of time and money writing about and talking about, you know, is this fund better than that fund? Here's the latest write up on the, you know, ABC, Jupiter, uh, you know, Japanese equity fund, whatever it might be. But really, we're focusing on the wrong thing because it's asset allocation that drives the vast majority of our total portfolio returns. So in our view, that's by far the most important decision. Almost every academic study agrees that the total return driven by asset allocation is, is probably more than 70%. Recent studies are actually pegging it higher than 90%, up to 95% of your total return is simply driven by your asset allocation. Where are you investing money? And what types of assets are you investing in? So all of this energy and time and attention we do between, you know, is this fund manager better than that fund manager? Should I give it to this company? All of that's a little bit of a moot point, really, because asset allocation is driving the vast majority of returns. So we take advice from various different external providers uh, and we have our own internal investment committee as well. And we then decide on the optimal asset allocation for each of our portfolios. And what we're trying to achieve there is a portfolio that sits on what's called the efficient frontier. 
sounds a bit Star Trek, but this is a, a piece of investment research that was done several decades ago now, but it, it does hold fairly true. And what this says is that for any given level of return, there is a minimum level of risk that you have to take to achieve that return and vice versa. For any given level of risk, there is a maximum possible return. And if you're in that situation where you're taking the minimum risk for a given level of return, you are said to have the optimal portfolio. Uh, and what this looks like is a sort of curved line, generally. And just to point out, this is a very old graph. So don't pay attention to the percentage numbers here. It's, it's the principle I'm trying to paint. This is just one of the clearest examples I've seen. The, these graphs often get quite technical. This is a very straightforward example. But what we're saying here is that a portfolio that sits on the line is the optimal and the logical portfolio. It gives you the maximum return for a given level of risk or the minimum risk for a given level of return. Why wouldn't you want that portfolio? Now, it's very possible to have a portfolio that sits underneath the line, so it is suboptimal. We're either taking too much risk for the return or vice versa. It's not possible to have a portfolio that sits above the line, because that would be beyond the most optimal portfolio, which, of course, doesn't exist. But what we see here is a really interesting dynamic. So starting at the bottom with the turquoise diamond, we see in this example a portfolio in 100% bonds generates you roughly a 9% average annual return. I did stress this is a very old graph with roughly nine units of risk, which is on the bottom axis there. Now, if we come round the curve to the dark blue diamond, we go to 75% bonds and 25% stocks. We see here, we've actually done better in both respects. We've got a higher return, 10%, and we're only taking 8% units of risk. So logically, everyone would have that portfolio over and above the 100% bond portfolio. There is no rational reason to hold the 100% bond portfolio. Now, this is an example, but we so often see clients holding these suboptimal portfolios and, and there's no reason for them to do so. And then as you go further up the line, you'll notice we're increasing the equity, the stock holding. We're getting a higher level of return and we're taking subsequently higher levels of risk. The other thing to notice here is as you're getting towards the top of the line, notice how we're taking larger and larger jumps in the level of risk we're taking for smaller and smaller incremental returns. And that's generally how investing works. As you get to the top of the risk spectrum, you start taking larger and larger jumps in your risk for smaller and smaller marginal returns. So that's how we put portfolios together. We are aiming for the optimal portfolio that, that sits on the efficient frontier line. That's mainly driven by asset allocation. And then only after that do we go into the fund and stock selection process. We monitor portfolios on a daily basis and we will always make tweaks or adjustments if necessary as the market dictates. And of course, you will often see far more of that kind of activity during what are sometimes turbulent times in the markets. So before we close, I'm just going to go into a brief Q&A session. So if you would like to ask a question, just uh, click the, the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, and then you can just type in a question that should pop up here. Um, I've got hundreds of people on the webinar this morning. It's been a very, very popular session for obvious reasons. So I'm probably not going to get to everybody's uh, question. Uh, apologies if I don't, uh, don't get to yours, but I'll try and pick up the ones that are going to be more relevant to, to most people. Um, I've actually had pretty much the same question from two different people. Both Barbara and Carol have asked, uh, yeah, is now the right time to pay off student loans uh, for our children, effectively, I'm assuming is what we're saying here, for higher earners? Now, the answer to the question is very nuanced, and it's actually a very, very complicated process to really figure out if you should or shouldn't pay off the student loan. And the reason for that is that the interest rate that you pay only has any relevance if you are likely to pay off the debt because student loans generally nowadays are written off after 30 years. So if your children or, or even you are a, a slightly lower earner and you're not paying enough to fully clear the debt, the interest rate then becomes a bit of a moot point because you, you just need to think about the monthly payments that you're making. And it could well be that you only ever clear half of the total. Now, if you're a higher earner, and you are on track to clear the whole of the student loan debt, 
I would say in general, if the facility exists, then then yes, it is a good idea to clear the borrowing. But yeah, do make sure you do the the, the, the due diligence on this. There's some good calculators that you can use online as well to, to try and figure this out. But if you're likely to clear the whole of the borrowing, then often it can make sense to, to try and clear it off. Uh, Aftab has asked, uh, would it make sense to buy short term bonds with spare cash? Um, it depends what we're talking about when we say bonds, Aftab, and th this is not your fault. This is just the way the, the investment world works. Um, we could be talking here about government bonds or gilts, or we could simply be talking about effectively fixed rate cash bonds, just, just savings accounts with a fixed term. Given that the yields on fixed rate savings accounts are fairly similar to, to government bonds, I, I think I'd be more inclined towards the cash bonds, given the uncertainty in the, the, the gilt market at the moment. But I think that is a, a pretty good plan, but perhaps not for too long. As I say, at the moment, we're not being rewarded for, for locking into longer terms. And I suspect that rates will probably get better before they start getting worse again. So it, you know, it might be worth just biding your time a little bit and seeing how the next couple of Bank of England interest rate decisions play out. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, has said, to what extent are you using Monte Carlo modelling in your investment strategies? Um, for those people not aware, a, a Monte Carlo simulation is the opposite, really, to what you would call a, a, a fixed or a, a, a sort of a, a linear model. So with a linear model, you apply a set of assumptions. You know, let's imagine we have an assumption that investments grow by 5% a year. In a linear model, you just assume that that applies every year consistently for the rest of time. Now, what a Monte Carlo simulation does is it takes all of the different economic variables, you know, interest rates, inflation, house prices, investment growth, muddles them all up and then runs loads of different scenarios based on all sorts of different assumptions. So what you then get is a range of different outcomes from very good to very bad and then a, a sort of a, a most likely or an average scenario in the middle. Um, and the answer to the question is, yes, we do have the ability to run Monte Carlo simulations as we're putting plans and, and portfolios together. Um, let's have a look at some other uh, other questions. Um, what else have we got here? Oh, well, th yeah, this is a fantastic question from Philip, actually. Um, so Philip is asking the question, um, are you using volatility as a definition of risk? That's a fantastic question. Um, and the answer, Philip, is no, we don't. And, and when we're having conversations with clients, we are at pains to point out that very often investment commentators will, will sort of conflate the two, you know, that they will assume that volatility equals risk and risk equals volatility. They're actually very, very different things because volatility is the temporary undulation in prices risk to me is the chance of a permanent loss of capital so let, let me give you a couple of examples here so if we want to invest in something that perhaps is quite volatile let, let's use the s p 500 index in america as an example it's really quite volatile it's down by 25 percent this year roughly in, in dollar terms so it does go up and down, but over time, it's generated massively positive returns for investors. Now, do I think if you invest in the S&P 500, you have a big chance of a permanent loss of capital? Are all 500 of the biggest companies in America going to go bust simultaneously? It's very, very unlikely. And if that happens, it's probably called Armageddon anyway, so we won't be bothered about the value of our portfolios. So I would say that as an example, is a high volatility, but arguably fairly low risk option. Now, flip it on its head. Let's imagine we invest into a single company, uh, a new startup business. We invest £100,000 and it just consistently loses 10% every single year until the point that it goes bust. That's an investment that it is displaying zero volatility because it's on a perfectly smooth and consistent trajectory albeit in the wrong direction. So that would have very little volatility, but very, very high risk. So the two are very different terms and concepts, but yes, they are often used interchangeably, which I, I don't think is, is necessarily correct. Uh, yeah, Gordon has asked, yeah, I have separate pensions and ISAs with different providers, all being paid different fees. Uh, I am the only one with a view of the whole portfolio. Uh, is there a benefit of using the likes of yourself to coordinate it all? 
Um, I, I would say, Gordon, yes, there is. You know, I think a portfolio should always be viewed as a whole rather than just the, the individual constituent parts. And that's not necessarily to say that we don't have different pots for different purposes or with different investment strategies. But I think it is important to, to consider the whole as well as just the individual components. So we will always have a, generally speaking, a bird's eye view, if you like, of the, the different pots that clients hold. We have different aggregation systems that can put all of that together and then analyze it as one rather than in its just in, in constituent parts. Um, let's have a look at some other questions. Um, so, yeah, Peter asked, yeah, when will the recording be available? Recordings will probably come out on Monday for you, Peter. Um, other people are asking, yeah, of course, the interest rate issue is, is popping up quite frequently. Um, so, yeah, um, somebody's asking, are the particular market sectors which perform better during periods of increased interest rates? So generally speaking, it's going to be the sectors that, that benefit potentially from increased interest rates. So, you know, the banks and the lenders tend to do quite well in this environment. Uh, and generally speaking, this may not mean that companies are outperforming, you know, absolutely, but in relative terms, you will generally find it's companies that have more pricing elasticity, if, you, if, if that makes sense. Generally speaking, the core goods and services that we kind of have to buy regardless. So it's the companies that can pass on cost increases to consumers quite easily. So it's supermarkets, uh, utilities, energy companies, fuel, these are things that we sort of have to buy to a certain extent. So those companies will tend to do slightly better. It will be perhaps discretionary businesses that we have choice over. If they're passing on cost increases, then we, we might well think might not make that purchase this year, we might defer those purchases possibly. Um, I've got uh, a few people actually. Yeah, I've got uh, Sandra. I've got Stuart. Um, people asking you, yeah, how does your service work? What are the, what are the charges? Um, I've got yeah, a couple of questions about how does the, the process work? Let's go into that now. I've got a couple of slides just to, to talk you through that. So, uh, of course, in a, a webinar setting like this, we can only ever really talk in a, a sort of generic context. So if you would like to talk about your own investments, your own financial planning, your, your own portfolio, uh, we invite you into our financial planning process, which begins with a discovery meeting. Now, ahead of that discovery meeting, we would provide you with a, a brief pre-meeting questionnaire for you to complete and return to us ahead of the meeting. Uh, and that really serves a dual purpose. Number one, it allows us to do some preparation work ahead of the meeting. And number two, it allows us to pair you with the most appropriate advisor in the practice based on your circumstances and the advisor's skills and expertise. We then have the discovery meeting itself. Uh, that can either take place over Zoom, as we're doing right now, or albeit on a one-on-one -on -one basis, or alternatively, we can have those meetings in our offices uh, on Northumberland Avenue, just off Trafalgar Square. Uh, and the discovery meeting is your meeting. It's your opportunity to explain, you know, where are we now, any issues or challenges or pain points that we need to deal with. Uh, and most importantly, where do we want to get to? You know, what, what do you want your portfolio to do for you? What purpose does it serve and, and how can we best achieve those objectives? We then go through a further meeting we call the financial planning meeting. Uh, and that's where we focus on that lifetime financial forecast for you. So we look at all of your incomes, expenditures, assets, liabilities, project all of that out many years into the future. And that's when we can tackle some of those big questions. How much do I actually need? How much is enough? Could I afford to give money to the children? Perhaps I could spend an extra few thousand a year on some additional holidays. You know, these are the big questions that we can answer as we go through that process. We then go away and do a full analysis of all of your existing holdings. And then we come back to you with a personalized recommendation report, giving you the output of that analysis. So we'll show you how things are doing at the moment, how they're invested, what the charges are, how much volatility are you exposed to. And then if we believe that there's an optimization or an improvement that can be made, then that will all be detailed in the recommendation report as well. Uh, and we always take a holistic view of a client's circumstances. So in addition to things like investment analysis, which of course is relevant in the context of today's webinar, we may make some recommendations for your estate planning to reduce inheritance tax, to improve your retirement income. All of those things would be included in your recommendation file. And then finally, we come back together for another meeting to talk about those recommendations, walk you through it, go through any questions you might have, 
and then we can agree on a plan of action from that point onwards. So that's how the process unfolds. In terms of the charges for the discovery meeting, we charge a fixed fee of £197. That's including VAT, and there's no commitment or obligation beyond that point if you don't want there to be. So that, that's just for that meeting. As I say, we, we, we allow normally two, two and a half hours for those meetings. There's a generous amount of time for us to go through all of the different issues and anything that you'd like to discuss. At the end of that meeting, you then have the opportunity to engage us for the rest of the process that we see on screen. So that includes the financial planning meeting and the production of that forecast for you, the production of the written analysis and recommendations report, and then a further meeting to discuss that with you as well. So for that part of the process, we charge a fixed fee again of 1950, again, including VAT, and there's no commitment or obligation beyond that point if you don't want there to be. So that, that's how the initial financial planning process unfolds. Now, at, at this point, if I was presenting this as a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar session, inevitably hands would go up and say, OK, Matt, yeah, th this all sounds lovely. But uh, how much does it actually cost to implement the recommendations? And my answer is always going to be it will depend. Of course, everybody has a, a different set of recommendations and we, we have different clients with different circumstances. But for our portfolio management services, if we're taking on the, the management of pensions, investment portfolios, we will tend to charge an implementation fee of between around one and two percent of the, the portfolio that we're looking after. And then for our ongoing financial planning services, we charge between a half and a one percent, depending on the, the size of the portfolios that we're managing. So hopefully that gives you some idea about how the, the process and the costs might unfold. And uh, that brings us to the end of this morning's session. Um, I do hope you found it informative and beneficial. Uh, this is quite a, a different approach. You know, we have our core webinar sessions that cover things like estate planning, inheritance tax, retirement planning, which we, we've run for many years now, and we, we run those same sessions on a regular basis. This is a session I put together specifically given the current environment. So I'd be keen to have your feedback and hopefully you found the, the session informative and you, you'll take something out of it that you can apply to your own portfolio as well. Now, after the session ends, you should hopefully in your web browser automatically have a feedback form pop up. And on that feedback form, you can hopefully give us some brief comments and feedback on this morning's session and how you found it. But also you've got the opportunity on there to request your own discovery meeting. So if you would like to speak to somebody from the practice about your own circumstances, simply just tick yes, I would like a discovery meeting and someone will be in touch very soon to make the arrangements. For whatever reason, if that feedback form does not pop up automatically, just go to the web address we have on screen here, buckinghamgate.co.uk forward slash feedback, and that will get you to the same place. When you submit that feedback form, you'll be taken to a webinar recording page, and that contains all of our other webinar recordings. It does not contain today's recording because this is the first time we've presented this session. So we will be preparing the recording. That does take a period of time and we'll aim to have the recordings of today's session out to attendees at some point early next week. So that's everything for me today. Thank you very much for being with me this morning. And I do hope we'll see some of you for your own discovery meetings very soon. Thank you very much.